So uh, I think a lot of this this work after healing trauma or during the process of healing it is learning to be with people who haven't. And that's mad. That's the thing. That's the entire world. That's like 99% of the entire world. Everyone has gone through something through their culture, through their family, through their whatever. You know, this world isn't this, you know, perfect peaceful place. So we have to find a way to be with people in their mess and not take on that mess and have that bring us down. Hey beautiful souls, welcome to Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan podcast. Today we have Emily Marutian. Emily is an award-winning author and poet. She has published several best-selling books within the field of personal development and self-care. Over the past decade, she has developed a notable ability of simplifying psychological concepts and turning them into a useful resources for self-improvement and healing. Emily is also the founder of Mortian Entertainment, a multimedia company that produces empowering and uplifting material through books, courses and films. Without further ado, let's bring her on. Hi Emily, how are you doing? Hi Mad, I'm good. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Thank you. It's uh, I see it's... you're in Hawaii there or the Bahamas? <laughs> yes. Almost in America. <laughs> You're preparing for retirement? Oh, yes, absolutely. On top of my career right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's um, you know, I've been meaning to get you on this podcast for ages because, you know, obviously we met like, I think it was five years. No, it was before five, 2016. It was uh, 2016, yeah. Yeah, and um, we met online and we just ended up talking on Twitter and um, and then just randomly just connected because I was going through, um, you know, my mental health issues and you were helping me and you sent me, actually at that time, you sent me a book. Um, your I did. Book that you read, yeah, which I didn't <laughs> kind of read. <laughs> you know, one of those things. <laughs> it's like, I'll read it later and then it ends up in the box. <laughs> but then, then we kind of just, I just went off. I went through my own spiritual awakening. So I just deleted uh, social media when vanished. And, and then several years later, I was going through the boxes and I saw your book. I was like, oh my God. Emily, so she was the one I connected with. And then it was like, okay, I need to get in co- contact with her. So I think I added you on Facebook because it was on your book or something. Or right, yeah. Remember. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we just reconnected again. <laughs> Here you go. Right, yeah. Yeah. What's funny is that that year was actually particularly difficult for me too. Mm. And so when we connected and you were like, I'm going through a difficult time, I was like, oh yeah, me too. And so, you know, in helping you and talking to you is kind of like, as you help someone else, you help yourself too. Mm. So uh, it was a difficult period, but uh, yeah, like you said, we had our little gap there. You went away. I think I went away too. I, I deleted some social media too. I was just like, I need a break from all this. Yeah. And then uh, you just randomly popped up and you're like, hey, you remember me? <laughs> you actually said I was that like, you I do remember you. Yeah. You, you you actually said that. I was actually thinking about you the other day and I was like, huh, that's interesting. Yeah, and then I was. you're right. I was. That's yeah. right. I was thinking about that time. I was thinking about the people that I was talking to. And I was like, hey, I wonder what happened to that girl I said a book to. <laughs> <laughs> and she didn't read it. So <laughs> So, yeah. So then you were like, hey, you know, remember me, blah, blah, blah. And then you had gone to like a much better place mm. emotionally and mentally. And I had too. So we reconnected again. And I was like, hey, this is so interesting. We matched up when we weren't, you know, doing too good. And we matched up again when we were doing a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> and then now it just it just flows a lot better. I think we're, we're both in a much healthier uh, emotional mental state. Yeah, I had my first spontaneous spiritual awakening. You already had your awakening, but you were going through a layers of it. <laughs> yeah, my, mine was a slow, gradual awakening. I think yours was just like... Mine was just like, in the face, you're waking up now, yeah. done. <laughs> Overnight thing. <laughs> Okay, so obviously, you know, I know who you are. Our audiences don't know uh, who you are. Can you tell us a bit about yourself? Uh, Sure. So um, I was born in Armenia during uh, the Soviet Union, back when Armenia was still a part of the Soviet Union. And uh, we moved to the States when I was about five. And I've been living in Los Angeles for about 
30 years. And um, so I started writing pretty early on in my teens, actually. I just knew um, like around 12, 13 that I really wanted to uh, communicate through writing because I wasn't a very verbal communicator. I was kind of an introvert. So I wasn't like uh, trying to start up conversations with people. So for me, it was just a lot easier to communicate on paper, to write, to, I had a really wild imagination. It was just much more fun for me to just sit by myself and write and get all that stuff out on paper. Hmm. So in my uh, early teens, I started writing stories. I started thinking about writing books. And uh, it wasn't until my early 20s that I started getting into uh I majored in philosophy, so I was very interested in just why are we here? What are we doing here? Is there a God? You know, what is this universe? You know, what's what's the meaning of it all? <laughs> I just had to know. So I majored in philosophy, and uh, I did a little bit of psychology too, uh, sociology, history, just anything that had to do with people. Why are people? You know, why do they choose the behaviors they choose? Why are they the way they are? Why do we believe what we believe? Just very fascinated by all of that. So in that, I discovered that I really liked talking about that stuff, the makeup of the human mind, our emotions, and just the nervous system, the brain, all of that stuff. And so uh, I started reading a lot of books. I started, uh, started to put it down on paper too, like my own thoughts, my own experiences, and so on and so on. And that's basically how I, I became an author. It was just following my passion for a specific interest and just going with, uh, so that's, and when I was 24, I started my own publishing company mm -hmm. because uh, I thought it's better if I have more control over what's published, how it's published, how it looks, who it goes out to. So um, I started my own publishing company and I started publishing my books uh, then. And now it's been about, uh, Let's see. Oh, God, I forget how old I am every time. Uh, <laughs> I'm the same. As I, I, have to, I have to pause just a little bit and go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I'm just... I went on this uh, Google uh, age calculator to check out how old I am. <laughs> so so, um, uh, so I'm going to be 37 this year. <clears throat> So I guess if we did the math, it'd be 13 years since I started my publishing company. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I've published about, I think, 10 or more books. I forget that number, too. Um, but so, yeah, so the, the whole plan was to just kind of see if I can help other people through my experiences and my journey. So I'm an author. I'm also a poet. And I consider myself a philosopher because I still haven't lost that curiosity. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. You you said you were born in Armenia. So how was life like that then? Uh, well, so I, I was born in 84. And so the Soviet Union collapsed in about 91, 1991. Hmm. So uh, we were I, I was born towards the end of like coming to the end of like an 80 year long reign. And so, uh, you know, I remember my older sister and I, she's three years older than me. We used to play on the Russian soldiers' tanks because they were always parked outside on the streets. Yeah. So that was like a normal thing for us to go outside and see soldiers, see tanks, see all this stuff mm -hmm. and see like Soviet propaganda everywhere. And mm -hmm. uh, so we left pretty early on. So I was five when we left. We moved to uh, New York. So uh, I don't remember much from that place but I know that it had a pretty big effect on my parents and my grandparents because my grandparents were born uh, 38 39 mm -hmm. so this was near the beginning of the Soviet Union and so for them it was a very it was just a very tough period for everybody mm -hmm. there was like an era of uh, paranoia because of uh, the the red purge I think it was called where anyone who spoke anti-Soviet sentiments, or even if you said it to your neighbor, your neighbor could just call them and report you and overnight you would disappear. Mm. You would be sent to Siberia. You would just like be gone. So we've, my family has known people who overnight they just came and they took them from their beds and their families just never saw them again. Wow. My, my grandfather's uh, uncle, uh, was taken that way. He was a professor. And I guess in his class, he said something that sounded like it could have been anti-Soviet. Mm -hmm. And uh, they just came and they just took him. Mm -hmm. So that was a, so there was, it was a very scary time for a lot of them. 
you know, it, it, it's, it creates this, uh, this uh, instability emotionally and mentally. And so what you ha- end up having is like a, like a culture of trauma. What you end up having is like a widespread trauma where everyone is affected by the same thing. So this happens when there are big natural disasters like a tsunami, earthquake, tornado, whatever it is, or if the country goes to war. So it usually happens when there's a really big event and then the after effects or the event itself carries on for a long period of time. And it starts to affect the way you behave with other people. It starts to affect the way you behave with your kids. It starts to affect the way you parent. And so when it does that for a long period of time, like with the Soviet Union, what happens is that you're now born into the culture of trauma. You're now born into that state. And so as you're born into it, it affects your personality. It affects uh, the way you think, the way you feel, the way you behave. And so you don't end up realizing that you have been traumatized. So you take on the characteristics of trauma and you just think, well, that it, this is just me. And you continue to parent your children in the same way. And that's called intergenerational trauma, where you pass on the trauma to your kids and your kids' kids and so on and so on. And even as Armenians, you know, we've had uh, our genocide in 1915 and the widespread, uh, you know, exile of Armenians. You know, we, we were refugees all over the world uh, because of the genocide. And that in itself is also another trauma that gets carried down, that gets passed down from generation to generation to generation, and it affects everybody. Yeah, I I totally get it, because, um, um, I mean, my grandparents, when it was Pakistan and India, you know, there were war going on, so they had their sets of trauma as well, you know, they lost yeah. their homes, they lost their wealth, everything, they lost everything, and they had to flee because there was um, a war going on, you know, it was... Um, it is is horrible for them and they it seems like they have passed it on you know they there's a, mm-hmm. it just feels like it, it, someone has to break that trauma right and oh, yeah. oftentimes when you you are aware of it you you're the one who has to do it <laughs> you know right right and it's and the thing is that that makes it very difficult mm. because when you have a culture of trauma when you have intergenerational trauma in your family uh, not everyone sees it. So if you're the one who ends up seeing it, if you're the one who's like, hey, well, this doesn't seem right, or, you know, this doesn't seem okay, and you start going into your own journey, you're kind of doing it alone. You're kind of on your own with that because not everybody sees that. Not everybody even wants to see that. So uh, you kind of end up being the black sheep of the family. So how was your childhood? What were you like as a child? Well, I was a pretty sensitive child. So I'm someone who's very, uh, it's called a um, hypersensitive person. And that person basically means that they have a sensitive nervous system. So people with sensitive nervous systems are uh, more likely to develop PTSD. They're more likely to be traumatized. So two people going through Uh, the same experience. One might come out perfectly fine. One might come out with PTSD or traumatized. And usually that means that person has a sensitive nervous system. So uh, as a person who had sensitive nervous system, I was actually kind of primed for PTSD. So any incident like a car accident, illness, uh, any kind of incident like that could have very easily just given me PTSD. And uh, that's actually how I ended up having it. So what happens is uh, in your childhood, when you've experienced a uh, long term, like I said, a culture of trauma or intergenerational trauma, and you're kind of living in that space, and you have a sensitive nervous system. So you end up being a very anxious, very uh, like mentally imbalanced person. And what I mean by that is that you are constantly looking to other people to Uh, ground you to make you feel safe to make you feel to give you comfort and um, so when you're in an environment where that's not provided to you because people are going through their own stuff they're also traumatized they don't know how to do that to you because not it wasn't done to them so they didn't learn those healthy mental emotional uh, um, practices they can't do it to you so you end up um, getting something called complex PTSD. Now, this is a different kind of PTSD, and this is something that I developed in my childhood. So complex PTSD is different than regular PTSD because regular PTSD is basically something that happens from an event 
it's kind of like there's a before and an after, like a car accident, like uh, um, uh, you lost something, you lost a family member in a fire, you, you lost someone in a, in a traumatic incident or whatever it is. So there's always a before and there's always an after. That one's a little bit easier to heal because of the before and after. A complex PTSD is what happens to people when they've been in a traumatic environment for a long period of time. So there's no one specific event that uh, gave them the, the PTSD. It's, it's several events or hundreds of events. So kids who grew up in, in uh, war-torn countries, uh, kids who grew up in abusive households, if there's domestic violence, even if you weren't physically abused, but you witnessed domestic violence, so that can give you complex PTSD and complex PTSD kind of makes you uh, like internally unstable. So you don't rely on yourself. You don't have self-reliance. You don't have self-trust. You are either you are either turning towards others to validate you, to comfort you, to give you security, or you do the exact opposite, which is you just completely withdraw. Mm. You say others are not stable enough. I'm not stable enough. I need to pull away. So you, you get the two different attachment styles, which yes, is the anxiety, yeah. the, yeah, the, yeah, uh, the anxious this. one, <laughs> the anxious one and the avoidant yeah. one. So, and sometimes you can, you can switch back and forth as well. You can go from one state to another state. But so for me, because I had complex PTSD as a child and I did not know that until much, much later, it primed me for uh, panic attacks, for years and years of depression, uh, just not being able to find my own way, always feeling like I don't belong, like I can't connect with people, you know, what's wrong with me, I can't figure this out. Also why it took me into philosophy and all that stuff because life just kind of felt uh, meaningless. Like I just didn't, it's like, I don't wanna wake up every day, go to some job I don't like, pay bills, then die. You know, like that to me was like, that, that was the journey of life and I couldn't find much meaning in it. And that comes from PTSD. That comes from, from a childhood of not feeling emotionally and mentally stable inside because of everything that's going on around you that's not stable. Yeah. So I was a very sensitive child. Yeah. So uh, the, uh, sensitivity is really on point, especially spiritual, spiritually speaking, the more sensitive you are, the more you're able to tap into the energies of not just the physical like people humans but tap into the energies of different realms you know so um that's what i heard and it's it, only if you can um sort of hone it in and channel it mm -hmm. you know, in a in a, mm -hmm. in a cleansing way but i guess you have to go through the inner work to do that <laughs> oh yeah you for have sure so much trash inside of you you cannot connect with anything and you can't even connect with yourself Either. Right. And when you when you are that emotionally sensitive, we call it um, empathetic empaths uh, and people bother you, it becomes a problem to connect with other people. Right. So uh, this is the way that I was uh, throughout my teens and throughout my 20s. I'm working on it a little bit more in my 30s. But when I'm in a crowd of people, I can feel everybody's energy and it feels overwhelming to me. And it, and I have to do one of two things. I have to either internally kind of shut it down, which makes me look very like aloof, quiet, you know, like, Hey, yeah. why isn't she joining in on the fun? It's because I feel like emotionally overwhelmed by so many people. Right. Mm -hmm. Or I end up not going because I know I'm going to be overwhelmed, but I've been working on it more and more now where I can just kind of through meditation, through uh, therapy, through uh, bilateral stimulation, I've been kind of calming down my my nervous system more, not letting it activate so much around crowds of people. Like I'm much better with one on one. I can zone in on your energy mm -hmm. and we can have this flow. We can have this conversation. I'm very energetic. I can talk for hours. But when it comes to a setting where there's so many different energies around me, it's like it's like I can't. I can't really. I can. I, yeah, I, yeah, I'm exactly hard. the same. I'm exactly the same. Most people think that I'm an extrovert. I'm worried like because I'm at events doing so many things and I'm, you know, bouncing everywhere, you know, but um, <laughs> normally they don't realize it's like a two hours of a when I come back home, that's too exhausting. wiped out. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I get it. I totally get it. It's the same way with me. I have a social interaction and then it's like, okay, now I got to go charge my batteries for a while. <laughs> Yes. 
that's a and classic that's not, empath. And that's not, you know, saying anything about, you know, other people, you know, other people, the way they are is not wrong. They're not doing anything wrong. Mm. It's just that we're just very sensitive people and our nervous system gets triggered so easily mm. by other people's energies, other people's whatever. It's just very hard to be in that space. Mm. So we have to learn how to get grounded inside of us, how to kind of like protect our energy or to, 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 um, kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for here to put like a little bubble hmm. so that it's not constant energy coming at you from, from different people. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess like that's, um, when you're, when you're a child, you don't realize it you're, until, yeah. you, until you actually go into personal development and have your own, like, you know, do spiritual work. Like, oh, I'm, I'm like this because of this. And I guess like for empaths and sensitives, they say that it's really difficult to sort of thrive in this world but I kind of just disagree with that to a certain point because if you have unresolved trauma if you have you have so much of this trash inside of you yes it will be really hard for you to thrive yeah. because you're not empowered once you right. look at this trauma because we're very good at internal work we really are mm. we're very very oh, yeah. like reflecting and internal and we oh, yeah. go deep and we want to peel all the layers and we want to over analyze yes <laughs> which is good which is good because it makes us if there's trauma i'm, I'm gonna dig into it and i'm gonna peel oh, yeah. it and i'm gonna fix it <laughs> you know what i mean so rather oh, than yeah, sure. you know not no looking at it so when you um empty that trash inside of you you become empowered empath and then you can go out into the world and be a powerhouse yeah for sure i 100 percent agree i think it's really just about the inner work that we do um i think that once we do that inner work once we can ground ourselves once we can once we can um discover what it is that out in the world uh lights us up and fills up fills us up with energy because it's not that outside world uh depletes our energy it's that we just can't deal with everything in the outside world mm -hmm. extroverts can they could just pop them into any environment they're good to go we're a little bit more specific with that we we thrive in certain environments and i think you just kind of have to figure out what that environment is for you because when i'm working on a project with other people oh i'm so passionate i'm there i'm ready to go i have all the energy i need i've worked on projects where i've worked for 16 18 hours a day barely got four or five hours sleep i was awake at it again and just full of energy so you we're just a little bit more uh discerning we have to be a little bit more discerning about what we give our energy to and if we give it to the right thing our energy just like yeah yeah. Yeah. So, um, you so specialize in trauma work. We just uh, literally just talked about it. So, what in your view, what is trauma? So I uh, specialized in trauma work because trauma decided to specialize in me. <laughs> <laughs> so it chose me for this work because that, this is nowhere near what I wanted to do with my life. Okay. Mm -hmm. So like in my early twenties, I was in a rock band. I thought I was going to be a rock star. Okay. So I was just like playing bars and clubs in LA. I was playing like college parties. I was like, yeah, this is it. This is great. This is what I'm going to do. And then uh, it hit me like a ton of bricks after I got ill. Mm -hmm. And so that complex uh, PTSD that I was talking about from my childhood came back hardcore in my early uh, 20s through an illness. And that illness sent my entire world into like a tailspin, like a complete 180. I lost my band, I lost my friends, I lost my income, I lost my car. I basically lost everything except for my family. Mm -hmm. So it was like the universe is like, let's let's have a do-over. You're on the wrong yeah. path, girl. <laughs> often, so, often so, times the case. <laughs> yeah. So it just kind of like, let's take this away and let's take this away and let's take this away. And it just became like the stripping process of just taking everything away. And um, so in that process of trying to figure out what's going on, falling into depression, having panic attacks, I, I ended up developing a, agoraphobia where I couldn't leave the house without having a panic attack. I couldn't see other people. I couldn't be around other people. It was just like this overwhelming feeling. I was just like, what is this? Like, what is happening to me? I feel like my life just got flipped, turned upside down. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in 
trying to learn about what was happening to me, I discovered trauma and I discovered cultural trauma, intergenerational trauma, complex PTSD versus PTSD. And I ended up uh, just kind of journeying down that road because it was the only way that I was going to heal myself to understand what is this? What is this? How does it show up in my life? Trauma is something that uh, it's an event or an experience that, that activates your nervous system but your nervous system doesn't complete its process. So it gets stuck in a loop. And this is how you develop uh, PTSD. So let's say you experience a car accident, okay? And in the car accident, you feel activated. Your, your, uh, your sympathetic nervous system has been turned on. It's been activated. Something life-threatening is happening. Something scary is happening. And so your body goes through an experience. So when you walk away from that car accident, that experience is supposed to come down and you're supposed to be able to resume back. Your parasympathetic nervous system gets turned on and you're supposed to resume your life again. So when it's a traumatic event, the resuming part doesn't happen. So you stay activated and you fall into a loop and that's how you develop PTSD or complex PTSD. Mm, right, um, that's perfectly um, described really. So going back to uh, culture trauma, now if we have someone who's uh, collect, like who's healing their generational trauma, like their parents or grandparents and they're black sheep of the family, they kind of just kind of consciously expand away from them. How can they keep ties to that family, you know, and in a more, more harmony way? Well, so the thing is that as you see what's going on, mm. you don't... Uh, you don't want to be completely immersed in it, but at the same time, you don't want to completely, you know, cut off your family, your heritage, your culture, and just be like, bye everybody, you're all unhealed. So the, that's not really the answer. So as you heal yourself, what's going to happen is they're going to look at you and go, mm, something different about you. Mm. Uh, one of two things is going to happen. Either they're going to be inspired by your healing and go, you know what? I want that too. Like I, maybe there's something going on with me too. Like they'll, they'll see you as a positive reflection and want more of that for themselves too. Like when you see someone who's healed through something you're going through, you go, Hey, if they can do it, I can do it. Right. Mm. So it's a positive experience and they don't shun you. They don't don't push you out they just go you know like so what are you doing like what's happening what's going on with you I see so many positive changes in you I see so much health in you like I want I want that for myself too mm, yeah or the opposite happens where they're like oh you're not you're not like us so you know we don't know what to do with you we don't know how to handle your changes because the one thing that trauma does is it makes you really nervous about changes mm. and it it can make you really upset or angry when you see someone behave in a way that you weren't expecting them to because trauma tries to predict everything i want to predict how everyone is going to behave how this event is going to unfold because it needs that guarantee it needs that security and safety so when you start behaving differently it can trigger their trauma and go oh no some, mm. something something bad's happening, even though something bad is not happening. So they might try to push you away. They might get angry with you. You know, what are you doing? What's going on? So your job in that, if you want to keep your ties with your family, your heritage, that's all your choice. If you want to, you have to find ways to ground yourself. You have to find ways to kind of see the situation for what it is. They're unhealed. You're working on your healing. If they're wounds are still affecting you, you might need to re retreat for a while for longer periods of time until you can heal yourself enough where you could be around them and not have them trigger your, pa mm. trigger your pain, trigger your wounds or whatever it is. If you're still being triggered, you need time away, not complete cut off, but just spend more time away than with. And yeah. then as you just uh, build yourself up, as you uh, build your confidence, your empowerment, as you heal more, then you can be around them. And then when they do that thing, you don't feel upset. You kind of think it's funny, you know? Yeah, so yeah. You, you move to a different state where you're like, oh yeah, I know what that is. That's okay. And then you start feeling compassion for them. You start feeling bad that they've been through this thing that they don't even realize they've been through, that maybe it was passed down from your grandparents or great grandparents or whatever it is. And you see them as people who are just kind of suffering and they don't know how to deal with that suffering. And you feel compassion for them. You feel love for them. And then that doesn't make you want to go, okay, bye guys. I'm going to leave you in your suffering. Mm. So you, you give them healing in small increments through your own healing, through your own growth. Yeah. And if they want to take that, they can take that. And if they don't want to take that, that's okay too. You have to be prepared for both.
yeah. uh, scenarios. Yeah, yeah. and now, yeah, like it's perfectly like I, I'm in a similar situation, you know, like since I've been doing the expansive work and um, internal work and expanding myself, I feel like the more I'm expanding, the more I'm just moving away from my family because they're stuck in the same patterns, mm -hmm. the same habits and same way of being. Whereas I'm just completely diff different now. It's like we're not on the same vibrational length anymore. And it's like, how do I keep, mm -hmm. uh, how do I keep interact interacting with them without feeling like I just cannot be here? It's just nothing against them. It's just, uh, it's just the fact right. that I, I just cannot. I, I just cannot. You um, you might you might have to let go of needing them to be different than the way they are. Hmm. Not needing them to join you where you are and just kind of meeting them where they are. So in that you keep you keep your healing, you keep what you've learned, you meet them where they are, but you don't go to their emotional, mental, you know, level or you and you don't try to drag them to yours because they can't come there. They haven't done the work. Yeah. They haven't had the experiences and revelations and awakenings that you have. So uh, I think a lot of this this work after healing trauma or during the process of healing it is learning to be with people who haven't. And that's mad. That's the thing. That's the entire world. That's like 99% of the entire world. Mm -hmm. Everyone has gone through something through their culture, through their family, through their whatever, you know, this world isn't this, you know, perfect, peaceful place. So we have to find a way to be with people in their mess and not take on that mess and have that bring us down. And that's really the work that we have to do is, 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 in ourselves so that we can be with family, friends, people who are outside, you know, you're in line for, you know, coffee or whatever. And then someone starts getting upset and then you don't let that rattle you inside. That's the work that we have to do. Mm -hmm. And understanding that and remembering like you're here to do that specifically some souls on this planet come into this planet it's like i'm gonna take up that role and it's gonna be messy but i'm gonna have to do it and uh, you know it's a role that you have to take take on yeah. and there's huge rewards after uh, after it like literally like once you do the work amazing things like start lining up for you yeah for sure definitely yeah um so how can a childhood trauma be triggered by um, an event later on in life? Right. So um, the thing about childhood trauma is you don't realize you're experiencing it because whatever you, whatever environment you raise a child in, they're just going to think it's normal. Mm. You know, if you teach a child that at the end of the day, it goes, sleeps in a cage in the closet, it's just going to assume that's just normal. That's what I'm supposed to do. It'll, it'll walk itself to the closet and get in the cage by itself. So whatever environment you raise the kid in, it's going to think it's normal and it's just going to continue to function in that dysfunction. Mm. So as a kid, if you grow up in that environment, you just think the way I am, the way they are, they are, it's just normal. This is the way it is, even though it's upsetting for you, even though you feel like you can't communicate, you can't ask for your needs, you can't say no, you become a people pleaser. You don't see these things as being bad. You just see them as, well, this is just the way that I am. And it's not, it's characteristics that you've taken on from the trauma. And so as you go throughout your life and you grow up with these characteristics that are traumatizing characteristics, that characteristics you develop through trauma, something in life will happen that will impact it. And as it impacts it, whether it's an illness or a really bad breakup, your husband leaves you, you know, someone dies, whatever it is, it kind of rattles that, that trauma and it wakes you up. And as it wakes you up, you start to go, wait a minute, you know, maybe this isn't the way it's supposed to be. Maybe this isn't the way I am. Maybe this has something to do with the way I was raised. As you start to wake up, you kind of look at, and even with interactions with other adults, you go, hey, that's interesting. They had a different childhood than I did, or they, they have a different experience. Why are they more confident than me? You know, is it because this is just the way I'm born or is it because my environment created this personality? So that awakening process happens more as an adult than a child, because as a child, you just can't see that the things you're going through aren't normal. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. Do, do, when was your transformation? Like, um, let, now let's get into your transformation and uh, journey of self-healing. How, how did that come about then? Yeah, so like I said, uh, in my early 20s, I was in college, I was just kind of very social, very active. 
um, in a rock band. I was playing all over the place. We were having a lot of fun. I was just in a really like euphoric state of just, hey, this is great. I'm, I'm going out every night. I'm doing things. I'm, I'm working. I'm taking seminars. I'm going to school. I'm playing in a you know rock band. And so when all of a sudden just I felt really sick one day, just hit a wall. You know, you can't sustain that kind of life. Mm -hmm. So I I hit a wall and I started to get sick. And it was like one after another, after another, it was like one thing. And then it was another thing. And then it was another thing. It's like what I talked about earlier, where if you have unhealed trauma for long periods of time, it starts to catch up with you. And it was starting to catch up with me, but I didn't know that. So then I kept going to doctors. I kept doing, is it this thing? Is it the other thing? And just several different doctors trying to figure out what's wrong with me. Uh, I ended up having surgery uh, on my ovaries because I had like these grapefruit sized cysts that were constantly causing me pain, constantly causing me ab abdominal issues, but that wasn't even really the issue too. I had so many different issues that started to pop up in this small period of time, I felt really overwhelmed. I was, I would wake up like just really anxious, like, oh God, what's going to happen next? Like, what is the next thing? I developed health anxiety where I became really, really paranoid about what it was that was going on in my body, what's going to come up now. So this, this created a lot of uh, panic attacks, a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression. Uh, this was the PTSD kind of rearing its ugly head and I didn't know. And so um, I developed agoraphobia where every time I would go outside, I would think, oh no, something horrible is going to happen in my body. I'm going to get really sick right now. And then I would have to go home. I would only feel safe at home. And so in this process of going through this for probably about a two, three year period, as just more and more symptoms started coming up. And that's the thing about trauma. And that's the thing about anxiety is uh, if you're in it for a long time, you start getting more and more symptoms. And it becomes like the cycle. The symptom creates the panic, which creates more symptoms, which creates more panic. And then you just fall into the cycle until it gets worse and worse. And your world gets smaller and smaller and smaller until you have this agoraphobia where you can't even, you know, go outside. Yeah. So, so uh, in the middle of that, I thought, well, what am I going to do? Like, this is, this is not sustainable. I can't live my life this way. I, something needs to change. Mm -hmm. So this is when I started really looking at uh, trauma, looking at the way it affects you. Agor I looked up agoraphobia. Uh, I looked up all these things and I discovered these books, these online seminars. I went back into therapy. This was around uh, 2016 when we met. That's when I had officially been diagnosed with PTSD. Mm -hmm. And um, I was like, okay, no, I have to go to therapy because the years before that I had been working on my healing just by myself. And as much as, as much as I healed, it still wasn't that it still wasn't to that point where I felt like I was okay. Like now I feel I'm okay. Mm -hmm. But before it was just like, it was just another thing and another thing. And I just didn't know how to heal it as much work as I did by myself. I needed some extra outside help. So I went into therapy. I was officially diagnosed with PTSD, even though I knew the diagnosis, but I still needed like someone to say, yeah, this is what it is. And so then we started doing EMDR therapy, mm -hmm. uh, which is, um, I can't remember what the, the names, the, the acronym stands for, but it has to do with bilateral stimulation. So you have a bilateral stimulation device. I have one. Okay. So here it is. Mm -hmm. It's these little things that you hold in your hand. Mm -hmm. And when you turn it on, it vibrates first on the right side, then on the left side, then on the right side, then on the left side. And what this does is it integrates your left and right side of your brain. Mm. This helps you process trauma. Mm. This is one of the uh, quickest ways. And I say quickest because it takes a long, long time, years and years. It's one of the quickest ways to heal PTSD. It takes a little bit longer with complex PTSD, but with PTSD within two to eight sessions, you usually have like a 90% decrease in panic attacks in PTSD symptoms. Mm -hmm. So it works with both sides of the brain as it triggers one, then the other, one, then the other. It helps your brain kind of work as a whole. It integrates it. And as it integrates it, it helps you release. Like, as I was talking about before with the nervous system that's stuck on a loop, this breaks the loop. Mm -hmm. So you can do it through the bilateral stimulation device. You could do it through tapping mm -hmm. like this on each side it has the same effect. You can do it through audio where you hear a click here and then a click here, click here, and then a click here. You can also do it through a visualization where 
your eyes just move from one side to the other. Mm -hmm. So all of these are considered EMDR therapy. It helps uh, kind of break the trauma loose that's kind of stuck in on repeat. And you're able to just kind of like shake it out, sweat it out. It just physically, you have a physical reaction as it's leaving your body. You can feel it leaving your body. And so that's the therapy I went into and uh, I'm still in it. And I'm working through, because it's complex PTSD, there are so many different events that you have to work through. When it's just one, it's a car accident, one and done. You can usually work through that within a few sessions and you're done. But when it's complex PTSD, it's a, it's a much longer process because it's so many different things that you're trying to unhook from your mind and unhook from your body. Hmm. That's really interesting. I interviewed someone uh, for the podcast and she was talking about the EMDR and it's, it's quite intense um, um, yeah. stuff, isn't it? So, yeah, I mean, like, I'm really, I just want to say I'm really, really proud of you for how far you come because you basically, when we were talking, you were more of the motivator. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I always never guessed. I would have never guessed that you were going through, I knew you were, everyone was going through something. Everyone is always going through do something but I was always coming to you for advice and you were like no Madhya do this 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 your emotions <laughs> and your intense emotion this is how you deal with it and it was like I had no idea that you were going through <laughs> something similar oh yeah for sure I, I was and for a long time I had a really really uh, close friend who was also like a coach and a mentor to me and she had been through a lot of stuff herself and for for about five six year period she was basically my therapist. She was basically the one who was helping me through all that. So whatever I was going through, she was basically the only person who knew because I would, I would take my stuff and I would go with her and I would work it out there mm -hmm. and she would help me. And so throughout the rest of my life, I was helping other people. I was just kind of like, uh, you know, you need help, you need help, you need help through DMs, through messaging, through phone. I did a bunch of coaching myself and I was just so just very, very able to help other people, but having a really, really hard time with myself. Yeah. And so that's when my friend Jane came into my life and she was just like uh, a really good mentor and, and helped me get through a lot of that stuff. So I was able to, you know, I wasn't ignoring my stuff. I wasn't ignoring myself and only focusing on others. I was just uh, having a different private space for that mm -hmm. as I was helping other people. And I think that's very, very important to yeah. have yeah. that space that person whether it's a professional therapist whether it's a friend who's emotionally stable mentally stable can can offer you sound advice you know mm. you you need you need something like that because it's it's too much yeah it you definitely do and um, i guess like um you you have to go through that yourself and helping other people and then you, you while working on yourself you help other people it's like there's no feeling like it you know it's 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 amazing oh, yeah, for sure. it, especially for empaths you know we always give 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 but like you said you have to give yourself as well you have to ground yourself as well um oh yeah now, absolutely yeah so i was um thinking about the intense emotions that i just mentioned like for our audiences who are dealing with like intense emotions how do you manage them well intense emotions usually are feelings of being overwhelmed or anger or sadness or panic those are fear mm -hmm. so fear anger sadness and overwhelmment are usually the emotions that take you from like a zero to a ten pretty pretty fast so one of the things that we do which is very unhealthy is we try to distract it. We try to uh, kind of push it down. I don't want to think about it because it's so overwhelming. You don't want to think about it. <clears throat> you don't want to get into it. But that's how the emotion completes. Every single emotion that you feel is a temporary experience. If you sit with it for a moment, let it rise, let it do its thing, and then it'll come back down. But when it rises, we don't want to let it do its thing because it feels scary. Mm -hmm. It feels overwhelming. It feels like it's too much. We, we, we think that the feeling is going to overtake us like a tsunami, and then we're just never going to be the same again. And that's just not true. When you sit inside the emotion, when you sit with the emotion, when you breathe into the emotion. So one of the things that you can do is an emotion shows up physically in your body always. Shaking hands you know, clenched fist, like your, your throat's drying up, your heart's beating. Emotions always show up physically in your body. So what you want to do is you want to just sit for a moment, 
find it in your body. Where is it? If it's, if it's clenched fists, breathe into your fists and let them go. If it's uh, your throat, just kind of focus on your throat, breathe into your throat, just kind of relax it, swallow. So as you pay attention to where the emotion is showing up, track the emotion in your body. And when you find it in one place, breathe into it, relax into it, because the emotion is not dangerous. It's not threatening. No emotion is dangerous or threatening. It's just when we act on the emotion, we get scared like, oh, no, I acted out of anger and I created all these problems. Well, that's the act, the behavior. That's the problem, not the emotion. The emotion is normal. The emotion is healthy. Whatever comes up for you is normal and healthy because that's just what's coming up for you. That's your that's the experience you're having. Don't make the experience wrong. It's not wrong. It's being triggered by something. You're having an experience. So sit with the experience, breathe into the experience, let the experience go. Once the emotion starts uh, coming down from its intensity, maybe look at it more from a curious perspective, inquire, what is this? What triggered it? Was my boundary crossed? Do I need to have a conversation with somebody? What do I need to do in this situation? So, so do the doing after the intensity has calmed down, not in the intensity. Mm. Because when we're in the intensity, our only, our only um, motivation is to get the intensity down as soon as possible you know, yell back. So I feel better, you know, to just shut off the phone. So I don't have to hear this. It's like, you want a quick and easy results so that the intensity will come down, but that usually creates more problems. If you're acting through the emotion, you're most likely going to create a problem if the emotion is anger or upset or something like that. So what you want to do is you want to bring it down and then act. So the best way to do that is to, to take a moment Sit with it, feel it throughout your body. It will pass. It's going to pass. Let it pass. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The power of sitting with your emotion is amazing, incredible. You yeah. know, um, I did that for two years, constantly just sat with, asked myself two questions. How am I feeling today? Are you okay? Like in the most loving and compassion yeah. way, you can, you know, you can do that. Like you're asking someone else, you ask yourself. Because in our society, yeah, we don't, perfect. we don't think about, like ourselves that much it's always like oh what can i do for you what can i do, 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 do? Right. So, you how know? are you yeah. and when someone says how are you you go fine yeah fine yeah so yeah yeah. Fine. Oh, good. Good. Fine. <laughs> yeah yeah so it's so so important to sit with your emotions and feel them fully so there is no nothing left in you you know like i always say it's like it's like almost something happens to you i don't know something small and um and you feel so angry about it it's like what well, you, you try brush it aside really quickly and then it's like it's like buried inside of you you try to shake it off with right. like oh i'm gonna go as you, yeah. right as you brush it off though what happens is your cup gets filled yes exactly it's it just keeps bad. getting filled and filled with more and more experiences that you're not actually dealing with. Yes. And the more you don't deal with it, the more it gets filled until one day one small incident happened and it Boom. just spills on out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then absolutely. you're confused. You're like, why did this thing cause this reaction in me? It's not that thing. It's all the other things that filled up to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you kind of have to, it's like, if you're on the personal development path, you have to look, it's like, oh, where did that trigger come from? When, when was the first time yeah. I experienced this? Oh, it's going back to like 10 years ago, <laughs> you know? And then and how like, many times, and how many times am I triggered throughout my day with this specific trigger? Yes, yes. Absolutely. Because that's the thing. You can't, you can't stop what's going on in the outside world. Mm -hmm. You can't control other people. So you have to work on your own trigger triggers internally because other people are just going to do whatever it is that they, they, they're going to do. You can't spend your life fighting them to try to get them to comply with how you want them to behave. It's just a lost cause. It's not going to work. Mm, absolutely. I mean, your emotional guidance, guidance safe system is the most powerful thing there is, you know? Yeah. So if you have some, I, I call it trash. You can call it whatever. You can call it candy floss inside of you. Whatever. I call it call. wounds. <laughs> Perfect. They're wounds, not trash. <laughs> yeah. Keep on purging it out. Purge it, purge it, purge it. You know, the more you have toxic things, it's not toxic, but it's it's if it's toxic to you if you're not looking at it. You know, so the more you have it inside oh, of, of you, sure. so not just you, to you, to everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But purge it, purge it, purge it until you feel so light and so calm that your everyday life is just pure bliss because and the thing know. is that that the purging is not ignoring 
The purging is not distracting. The purging is when you sit with it, it releases. The release is very different because we think, oh, okay, well, I don't want this emotion. Well, okay, but it's the emotion you're having right now. So if you sit with it, Mm -hmm. if you welcome it, it goes away. That's that's the irony of emotions. As you say, okay, sadness, welcome. Welcome to the space inside me where you're arising from, you know, and just, mm-hmm. just sit with it. And then suddenly it's just, it's just it fun. Yeah, it goes. Yeah. Sometimes but if you're like, hey, sadness, what are you <laughs> doing here? Get out of here. Yeah. And you're trying to fight it. It's going to push through even oh, more. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Even more. yeah. Yeah. I guess like fighting, fighting is the worst thing you can do. If you're feeling something yeah. or for someone, do not try and fight it. Just go with the flow of it because your emotional guidance system is. Well, directly... because you're just, you're fighting yourself. Yes. You think exactly. you're fighting that other person. You think you're fighting that event. You think you're fighting whatever it is, but whatever is happening is happening internally inside you. Mm. And so what you're fighting against is what's happening internally inside you. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. So is this what you talk about in your books then? Yes, more and more now, I think that uh, the way we manage our emotions, the way we handle our emotions are very important to our health. And so uh, now more than ever, I've started writing about uh, how to bring people clarity, how to br- bring people relief and ease emotionally and internally. Because initially I started writing philosophy because uh, that's what I was studying. I wanted to be a philosopher. I wanted to be a philosophy professor. So initially I started off with uh, philosophical books and then slowly I started getting into more and more um, psychology, more and more uh, emotional healing, mental healing, because that's what I was going through. And as I was going through these things, I thought, okay, since I'm learning this, let me teach others too. They might not know, they might be in a similar situation as me. Let me go ahead and put this information out there as best as I can and just let people learn for themselves and heal for themselves. So yeah, my, now I think more of my books are about self care, they're about self compassion, they're about finding uh, internal relief and peace and ease. Where are these books? Is it on Amazon? Yeah, the books are on Amazon. They're on uh, most bookstores online. They're available worldwide. Um, So there are Kindle versions. There are are paperback versions. There are uh, hard copy versions. So, you know, whatever works for you, you can find most of my books online. Oh, fantastic. So, you know, uh, last year was tough. Uh, for a lot of us actually you know going through this covid and understatement uh, (laughs) (laughs) it was was like a big spiritual switch as well between (laughs) masculine to feminine and (laughs) talk about cultural trauma that was like a worldwide trauma (laughs) i know right so did you learn any big lessons during 2020 oh boy did i so Mm -hmm. i start so so uh i don't know about um the uk but here in LA, we went through the first initial shutdown in March of last year, March of 2020. So uh, this happened about five days after my my dog died. And my dog for me was my emotional comfort, my emotional stability. So as I was going through these things in my 20s, my dog was like something that I could turn to, to just kind of check out of life and just focus these like loving, compassionate feelings with him. He helped me like emotionally heal a lot. So as we, as I lost him so very suddenly, the lockdown happened and I went on this like emotional tailspin mm. and it was just like, I didn't have him. He was such a comfort to me. He, he, he decided to go on his next journey. Mm. And so it was, it was now that I look at it as just perfect timing. But at the time I was just like, oh no, like, mm. wait a minute. And so stuff started shutting down, work started shutting down, everything started changing, it was a very traumatic experience, but I had learned so many things on how to calm myself, how to, how to work through my stuff. So I started doing that. And I started to notice that it's not working. <laughs> this is like another level. I've hit another level now, it's not working. Yeah. The tools that I had before are not, are not working for me. Mm. So I had to learn new tools. I had to learn new things. And As I was in the process of learning these new tools, trying to balance myself, my grandmother got very, very sick. She ended up developing cancer and within uh, six, seven weeks, she was gone. And she was in hospice in my house and I was helping taking, I was helping to take care of her and I was there when she passed away. And so that whole entire experience was also 
very similarly with my dog because my my grandma was like a second mother to me. Mm. She offered me a lot of nurturing and a lot of love. When I was ill in my 20s, I would go visit my grandmother throughout the entire day because I was having so much anxiety and panic. She would help calm me down. Mm. So being in her loving, calm, relaxing nature uh, helped a lot of my anxiety in my um, mid to late 20s. And even in my early 30s, as I was going through my healing, she offered me a lot of emotional stability. So losing both of my emotionally, my emotional support people and dog within the same year was so incredibly jarring. This was the thing that sent me back into therapy because I had taken a break from it. I was like, I'm okay, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. And so it sent me back into therapy to kind of have to deal with this, this level of grief that I did not know that I had within me. And so they were both of their deaths brought out a lot of what I call frozen grief, grief that I had from long ago that had just kind of frozen inside me because I didn't want to deal with it. So their deaths offered another level of healing. Another layer got pulled back where I was like, oh my God, there's all this trash, as you call it, all this junk still there that I didn't know. It was like, we were on like maybe 10 feet in the water didn't know that if you go further down into the water there's all this garbage down there yeah and their deaths helps me see through just a whole bunch of grief a whole bunch of pain a whole bunch of just I thought I was losing myself honestly and so just losing that sense of emotional stability and I realized that okay so then the emotional stability it has to come from me it has to be in me it can't be from an outside source as much as they've helped me throughout the journey now it's time for that second part of my journey or the other half of that journey where it's about my stability internally and I'm not looking to other people to to ground myself to I got to ground myself internally Mm -hmm. and so 2020 as bad as it was losing people I know a lot of people who lost a lot of family friends Mm -hmm. Um, I would say that now in 2021, April of 2021, I feel like it was a much needed journey for me to, to rise to that next level of my healing. Absolutely. Totally agree. And what about you? Yeah, well, um, nothing big happened to me, like, you know, in terms of, um, like losing someone or any, anything like that. But like, for me, I think it was um lesson to slow down really slow down because I was way too much into the world and doing so many things and you know I was like just on stages and winning awards and just going to one place after the other because it was like okay Mm -hmm. I I am I'm I'm crazy do 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 do. very masculine energy and we all know that 2020 was like slap in the face for masculine energy yeah, right? yeah so. 2020 was like everybody take a break <laughs> yes I actually quite liked it actually to be honest I was just while everyone was like you so um it's a bit like extrovert it's like oh my god we need help I was like I have a more of an introvert inside him it's like oh no yeah I'm just chilled Same. out I was not I was not bothered by restaurants closing no, all wasn't. these places closing I was like yeah that's cool I'll just hang out at home <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'll start a podcast which i did uh yeah. but yeah it's, it's been a lesson for quite a lot of us we are more in tune with um i think it forced people to sit down with their emotions and feel their emotions oh, yeah. you know because uh, there was no way out and that's exactly how it is because we like you said it's like the the collective trauma we're carrying all this baggage and it's like what we're we gonna do you know it's like we're gonna we're gonna yeah. close everything off and you're gonna look at this and it's and it's interesting the way people have chosen to deal with this kind of trauma mm-hmm. like what it's brought out in them how they feel about covid Mm -hmm. how they're reacting to covid the closures the vaccines all that stuff it's just it's everything is i feel like is a revealing process of how do you deal with this thing now this is a big thing you're dealing with but the way you deal with this big thing is also probably how you deal with small things in your life in your everyday life Mm -hmm. so i think it's it was a very revealing time and i hope a lot of people just stopped and uh, looked inside and Mm -hmm. inquired about their own thoughts feelings behaviors yeah there's like the, 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 there's another way of being as well another reality mm. to everything yeah right so before we get into the rapid fire questions can you give us some tips how we can create a healthier emotional state yeah so the number one most important thing is to be with your experience your internal experience whatever it is that comes up emotions thoughts whatever 
If you dismiss it, if you shame it, if you fight with it, you're only going to create more chaos inside you. <clears throat> so what you want to do is you want to be with it. You want to befriend it. You want to have compassion for your experience. Look, and, and most likely it has not been easy for you. I don't know who you are or who's watching this, but I'm guessing that it has not been easy for you. So if you're having all this stuff come up, just kind of um, deal with it the way you would if a friend was telling you this. You would offer them compassion. You would offer them love. You would feel something like um, that's more kindness mm -hmm. as opposed to, why are you dealing with this? What are you doing? Why are you having these thoughts? You, you wouldn't say that to a friend. You wouldn't say that to a child. You wouldn't say that to your loved one. And But we say that to ourselves. So self-compassion, number one important thing. And you learn self-compassion by learning to sit with it as opposed to judging it, shaming it, pushing it away, fighting it, or any of those things, which most likely is a habit. Mm -hmm. If you are having a hard time emotionally or mentally, you have one of those habits. So that's one of the habit, the most important habit that you can uh, break or you can relearn is how you respond to yourself internally. That, if you can do that, it will change your entire world. That's the number one most important habit is learning to, to deal with your thoughts, emotions, uh, patterns, more healthy, more stable, more balanced way, which is to offer it compassion, which is to sit with it, which is to let it, let it do its thing. The way we function inside, we go towards rise and completion, rise and completion. But we start getting all up in there like, no, this is wrong and this is bad and I got to do this and I got to do it. And we start messing with that process because we want to control it because we're afraid of it. So uh, compassion, yeah, absolutely. sitting with it. Totally yeah. agree. Thank you so much for that tip. It's amazing. Um, now let's head into the rapid fire questions. Now, <laughs> <laughs> okay, are you ready? Ready. Yeah. Okay. Cool. What is your definition of God? Oh, girl, you started off with a big. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So for me. Uh, the divine exists in absolutely everything. I don't think of God as this, you know, father figure sitting on a throne judging us. I don't think of the Christian idea of God, even though I was raised a Christian. Uh, for me, the divine exists in absolutely everything. The tree, the bird, the bee, in us, in every single person. I believe that God is everywhere. God is in everything. I believe that it's a, it's a collective cosmic consciousness, mm -hmm. a kind of higher self that we are all a part of. Uh, it's not separate from us. It doesn't go away. I think we as humans can disconnect from it with all our junk, like not completely disconnect, but just kind of like mute it. Yeah. Um, but uh, you can always just unmute. Absolutely. Beautifully said. What do you think happens when you die? Uh, I think that since energy does not die, and that's a scientific fact, it uh, kind of recycles back into the universe. I think that's ultimately what happens to us. Our body decays and the energy being that we are returns back into this divine cosmic consciousness and we become a part of everything. We help the sun shine and the trees grow and the birds chirp and mm -hmm. we just kind of go back to our, our natural state, which is yes. as this energetic home. being. Home. home. This is where I belong. Yes. <laughs> home. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. How do you define religion and spirituality? Religion, I think, is a set of rules. Religion is a set of rules and rituals. Uh, it tends to be kind of within a perimeter, cannot go outside of. Spirituality, I think, is just the, there, there are no perimeters. There are no, you can make up your own rules and rituals if you want. But there's no sense of, oh, well, that's, that's oh, very, nice. very, very wrong. Yeah, very, very, no, I got to do it like these people. You cannot be a spiritual person if you're, judging other people, other people's processes, other people's religions, other people's beliefs, other people's whatever. So I think religion, religion gives us a lot of judgment. Religion makes us separate from others. My religion is different than your religion. I'm going to judge you for that. I'm going to feel like you're less than me. I've got the right way. You don't. So I think religion causes a lot of problems in this world because of how it's set up. 
And spirituality is just about opening yourself up to whatever it may be. You might not have preconceived notions of what God is, what this is, what that is. Mm -hmm. You're just kind of open to the experience of that spiritual experience and just let it come as it comes. Yeah, beautifully said. What's the lesson that <coughs> took you longest to learn? The lesson that took me the longest to learn is a lesson that I'm probably still learning. Most of my interviews. <laughs> For my interview. <laughs> Let me guess. Let uh, it go. <laughs> let it go. Let it yeah, go. so that's that's yeah, Elsa had it. She 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 got to that lesson pretty fast, didn't she? <laughs> um so so letting go, releasing, uh, not trying to control the journey. How hard oh, is that? Oh my god, yeah that's oh. so hard <laughs> that is such a masculine thing to do as well <laughs> it is and it's also from that trauma state right because trauma wants to control it wants to predict so I always find myself trying to predict how something's going to come about mm -hmm. and as I step into it and it starts going a little different from my prediction I notice myself getting a little upset and I'm like nope that's okay mm -hmm. we're not in control here the only thing I'm in control is of my my response and the way I experience it internally, but I can't control anything out there. So it's just about letting go of the control. Mm, absolutely. Totally agree. That's a lifetime or even lifetimes. You come back here and do it. Oh, again. yeah, for sure. <laughs> when we do this interview 10 years from now, that's still going to be Yeah, yeah. Answer. Okay. Is it still that? Yep. <laughs> um, so I'm fully in present moment when? When I'm writing. Beautiful. Yeah. Do you believe the there is, yeah, in the flow. Yeah. Do you believe there is an end to healing? Oh, no, definitely not. Mm. I don't because we keep living, right? We're not, ah. the life isn't over. Mm. So there's always something that comes up. Maybe the stuff that you've healed doesn't come up anymore, but then it's other stuff that comes yes. up. Yes. There's always other stuff that comes up as you're moving forward through your journey. Mm, absolutely. Totally agree with that. The world needs more of what? Understanding. I think um, we're so wrapped up in our own internal experience mm. that we don't see that other people are kind of experiencing it too. So when we have the pain, when we have the wound, uh, we're like, okay, well, I understand why I reacted that way. But when someone else has the pain or the wound and they react that way, we go, hey, why are you so angry? It's like, mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't seem to understand when other people are experiencing the same thing as we are and they're reacting from their unhealed trauma. It's almost mm -hmm. like we give ourselves a little bit of a pass in, in bad behavior, mm -hmm. but we don't understand other people. So we fight with them instead of just be like, yeah, that's, their, that's the same that's we have the same wound guy like yeah. we're we're all yeah. dealing with the same thing we're yeah. all dealing with the same issue so more compassion for each other more understanding yeah totally agree um now one last question before we get into uh how can people contact you what is that one message that you would like to share with someone who's going through adversity who's going through a spiritual awakening dark night of the soul what would you tell them right now i would tell them that it moves through waves, the pendulum swings. So as it's in one side, don't think that this is the way it's always going to be. This is your permanent state. It's not, nothing is a permanent state. You eventually start swinging right back. And when you're, you've swung right back, remember that you can always swing the other direction too. So you wanna do your healing as much as you can so that when you take that swing, when it's, when it's that contrast coming up again, you're better able able to deal with it because you stay in it less time it gets less and less and less for me it was years and years and then it became months and months and then it's weeks and weeks days and days now it's just a few hours when i get into a funk when i feel those emotions depressive anxiety whatever it lasts a much shorter time than it did before because i'm doing the work mm -hmm. so that's the thing so do the work but also remember that you're going to swing right back and that's okay. Nothing went wrong. You didn't do anything wrong. It's a part of the process. You go back to those things that you dealt with and you clean up more layers. Each time you clean up more layers, it's like breathing, right? You can't just constantly exhale. You have to breathe in again. It's a, it's an expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction, same way as your heart. 
This is this is the heartbeat of life. We go from one side to the other to the other. That process is normal. Don't make yourself wrong. Don't shame yourself. Don't think that something has gone wrong. You're doing it wrong. You don't get it. Do the work, but remember that the contrast is going to happen. Yeah, beautifully said. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, how can people con- contact you? Uh, I'm available on uh, my through my website, marutin.com, M-A-R-O-U-T-I-A-N.com. They can contact me through uh, Instagram. I have a Facebook page for my books. Uh, I'm on TikTok now. It's a new thing I've started to do. Just <laughs> oh record God, small, short, <laughs> small, short videos of just like giving these kinds of tips and tricks and stuff. And I post them on my Instagram too. So if you don't have a TikTok, that's okay. It's on my Instagram as well. Mm. So basically social media, I'm on, I'm on Twitter too. Just, uh, and my books can be found on Amazon in Amazon UK, Amazon India, Amazon uh, Canada, and just all the Amazons. I'm there. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Emily. For Thank you, Maddie. This, this was fun. <laughs> I know it was. I was just waiting for so long to get you on this podcast. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, when is she going to say yes? I finally um, gave in. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you so much uh, for sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us about trauma. I'm sure it is going to help so many people who are going through adversity, so many people going in, in a similar situation. So thank yeah, you, thank Maddie. you so And much. thank you for doing this podcast because I know you're also doing the same thing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan podcast. I would love to know what your biggest takeaway from this conversation has been. Share your thoughts on my Facebook and Instagram, Madhya Sosan. You can also check out my website, madhyasosan.com. If you would like to watch this episode, then head over to my YouTube channel, Mads Corner, M-A-D-Z Corner. If you enjoyed this episode, then please do rate and share this with your family and friends. Thank you once again, and I will see you on the next episode.